Transporter start. Okay, parameter spreadsheet is a checklist. So let's start at the top. Apply tools, settings. Nothing in the general tab. Backlight brightness, we can't really set that right now. Panel mode, DSC means that we're at 75 hertz on the 8KX headset. Smart smoothing is indeed on. Fixed foveated rendering is off. Parallel projections is on. Five only is off. Field of view is normal. Hidden area mask is on. Render quality is 1.25. That basically takes care of Pi Tool. Steam VR. Minimum vertical resolution for general video resolution of 4050. 4128 is a little above that, so that's good. This, since the general video resolution is already set correctly, I'm going to assume that my batch scripts have loaded the correct Steam VR settings profile, or it's a dot VR settings file that I just copy around. Uh, HMD quality, we'll make sure that this is set before actually running the VR application Elite Dangerous. And we'll go to alternate, we'll run ED profiler. Apply the primary preset which has HMB quality at 1.25. And that should be about it. One thing to note is that there are often tabs at the bottom of this spreadsheet. For the main spreadsheet at the root of the repository, there should be at least one tab for each application. Also, we have the Elite Dangerous Quality settings that would be set in the application itself. We also have the NVIDIA Control Panel settings for the specific application as well as what the global settings were set to. So, as long as everything matches up with this, or is at least very close to it, everything should work. Our load factor is less than one, so we're good to go. Our HMD quality for the app itself is 1.48, close to 1.5, which is very good on the AKX. Our load factor on the overlay is higher than what we've recorded previously, but that's just because I haven't updated that benchmark, so not really a problem. Now I'd run this panel here. The panel is sort of a kneeboard application. It's kind of like having Atom Text Editor, and it's going to run a virtual machine that runs Linux and looks at everything in this folder here, this panel folder, which is where I would put like a scratch pad for text or a link to open a spreadsheet that's in use by my PowerPlay faction or whatever else information I need in there. And I'll be able to quickly switch between things in there. To open all of the appropriate folders in the panel, I'll go ahead and run the script that's part of that set of files, and it'll start opening each folder on the correct virtual desktop. So this is just my little kneeboard computer over here. Now that all the support applications are started, I should mention that I ran uh, this batch script here, which would have launched Voice Attack and Joystick Gremlin, which is pretty similar to Target and what it does, it, although it does support controllers other than just Thrustmaster. So in this case, I'm able to use a Thrustmaster throttle with a Sidewinder Force Feedback Stick. Also, I've run the SimFFB tool here, which even though it seems to be showing the throttle, it actually does correctly apply damping and return center of tension to my force feedback joystick. Of course, I was already running this. Uh, all right, let's launch the actual application.
switch them. Switch them. So there I just switched to the VR applications window using the joystick pad and do it. And then I just hit a button on my joystick and throttle setup that happens to reach the escape key just to skip the splash screen. Construct desk relaxed. Incoming message. Switch panel recorder. Switch panel recorder. Switch panel quick. Switch panel quick. Switch them. So I can switch to the panel machine itself, which is a full Linux virtual machine as can be seen, or I can switch to the recorder app or just to whatever app is currently on the panel so I can get the mouse all the way over there quickly using the voice attack vectors. When I say switch panel quick, I'm directing not only that voice attack is to switch my keyboard and mouse focus to the panel virtual machine, but also to send the key binding left alt number one to the virtual machine which causes it to switch to the correct virtual desktop. So this way I can allocate one virtual desktop to maybe a scratch pad like this. And another virtual desktop to something like approach place like this. Switch panel quick. Switch panel quick. Switch panel plates. Switch panel plates. Switch panel quick. Switch panel quick. I can also direct a specific window to be open on the panel board. Switch panel. Switch panel win one. Switch panel window one. Switch panel win two. Switch panel window two. Switch panel win two. Switch panel window two. Which is not completely reliable because sometimes the task manager in Linux will misinterpret switch to this application as a command to minimize it if it already has focus. But it works if I can't really use the keyboard for some reason. Construct work in VR. Back. Construct work in VR. So in addition to my little small OVR drop desktop overlays, I can also bring up this application, which is Work in VR, which because I can control all of the monitors at the same time, I can lift them up or down as long as it has focus or move them all closer or further away. And because it has a nice curved center display, it's good for doing desktop work hours on end, like I could do some particular desk work that I have to do while I'm waiting for somebody who might call in to have me support them in Elite Dangerous, and I can just do desktop work on that all day. Will be 
this sequence of shortcuts, I'm sure most people have their own sequence of shortcuts, but this is part of the extended yeah, interface line, project, and it gives you a good there. idea of a layout that can be kept particularly consistent year after year, and at the same time limits the number of things that you have to deal with when you just need to get the simulator started in a hurry. Uh, rapid is usually the things that it would actually start before the simulator, so like joystick gremlin, voice attack, or even virtual desktop, so I can move over the virtual headset and then continue starting things up from inside the headset while I'm looking at a screen like this one. Uh, but after Rapid, most of the Rapid stuff can automatically be started with this batch script. Uh, anything else is like run PyTool in SteamVR settings and the checklist so that I can check over that they have the correct settings. And then after all that started, I can run the Kneeboard computer, this little panel virtual machine, or not. And then I can start the application. If I need to change settings, that's what the alternate folder is for. I can reset all of the SteamVR stuff, which is really the same thing as going down here and just quitting SteamVR. I can run ED Profiler, I can restore a different .VR settings profile, which will change the video, the SteamVR video resolution for me. If I need to, I can do the maintenance, and for Elite Dangerous this isn't too much of an issue, like the only thing that's really maintenance here is the backup, so I can back up my current video settings for this application to be restored later, but that's SteamVR video settings, but in DCS world it gets a lot more complicated. I may have to load specific mods depending on what I'm going to do, or upgrade the open beta from time to time. Import. These are just shortcuts to data that I might grab from other places, like my screenshots would be in pictures. Destruct work in VR. Destruct work in VR. Destruct desk. So obviously in addition to constructing my various overlays and having them pre-positioned exactly where I want them to be, I can also destruct them, which orders them to basically just shut down. It literally kills the process that's running them. And this can save some performance. Usually I'm going to set up the settings that I use for these applications so that there's plenty of headroom to run these overlays. But in the case of DCS World, for instance, I wouldn't really be using those panels except on the ground anyway for the most part or briefly. And in the case of Elite Dangerous, there's a rare chance that I might find that performance isn't doing so well and I'm in the middle of the asteroid field and it turns out I got a PVP situation on my hands and then I'm going to want to be, I want, I'm going to want to know that I can disable anything that's unnecessary just in case anything can go wrong. Construct work in VR. Construct work in VR. Now obviously a lot of this stuff is some sort of workaround or another. A key example of that sort of the sort of workaround that is included with the extended interface project is the hook that I use to start SteamVR and virtual desktop as soon as the headset becomes available. Also starts voice attack. So in the extended interface project, which has the spreadsheets for configuring these applications for a good balance of performance and visual quality. We also have the sequences for various things. And in addition to a sequence, virtual desktop also includes this little hook. Now the hook, I 
the hook works around a few things. First of all, you can't run a batch file from PyTool of where PVR home should be. So instead of simply replacing PVR home.exe with say PVR home.bat or something, instead we create a little auto hotkey script which just runs the batch file and we copy that hook.exe file to pvrhome.exe. Another workaround to deal with is that if voice attack was started with the operating system, it would not see the microphone from the headset because the microphone from the headset is not available yet. So one of the first things that hook.bat is going to do is to terminate any voice attack program that's running and start voice attack all over again. It's also going to try to set the Pimax audio devices as default, but that's only going to work for live if you've renamed them. Another thing that's typical of both the hook and the sequences is to start tools like EVGA Precision X1 which will set the clock rate for the GPU. It's not quite overclocking since most of these GPUs seem able to handle a much higher clock rate than even the best card ship with from the factory, but still, it's the overclocking program that needs to be run. And this will stop and start SteamVR. Some rather complicated batch scrubs, but the extended interface files are intended to be installed in a folder C colon slash core slash infrastructure slash extended interface, which means that all of the sound effects that the voice attack uses, batch files that get called upon by other batch files, they're always going to be in the same place. Why not program files? Well, there are a number of reasons not to do that here, and in any case, this is going to be pretty much global for the whole system. So it might as well be something that's short, doesn't have any spaces in it. So it's just C, core, infrastructure, extended interface. And then that's where you just clone the GitHub repository or download it as a zip file or whatever. So this batch script here will run every time that PyTool tries to call SteamVR home. So if we go, or well, not Steam your home, but uh, PVR home executable, which is normally built into PyTool. So if we open PyTool, basically this little checkbox that says start PyTool or start Pymax PVR home, I am just making this start something else so that tools like voice attack and virtual desktop start after the headset actually is already up, all the software that's supported is already running, etc. Destruct work in VR. Act. Destruct work in VR. Construct panel. Act. Construct panel. So hopefully this is a good illustration of how VR should work, at least in theory. You should be able to put on a VR headset, not have to take the headset off, interact with the keyboard and mouse desktop, and then put the headset back on, and something else goes wrong, and then put the headset back on. You should be able to just put the headset on, start your support programs, then run your desired application, maybe have a little kneeboard on the side which runs a file manager that's good enough that it allows you to quickly explore the entire depth of a directory tree and allows you to switch to specific types of documentation you might need on your kneeboard. Kind of like in real life you would have a actual notebook for a kneeboard and you put little yellow sticky tabs on the pages so you could flip to them specifically. Same thing here. You should be able to switch to specific applications, specific um, files that you want to read. It should be quick to navigate. And then once you're in your VR application, you should be able to do what you intend to do, like fly around, go about your business.
all ground defense systems guarding this part will react to Act constructor in the R. Just a few more things to note. Transparency works much better in VR than it would appear to on the recording. The, uh, the transparency through effect is much weaker. The, the windows that I'm looking at on this work in VR overlay are much more opaque than would seem to be the case. The text behind this black desktop background is just barely bright enough to be readable. Also, because it's in 3D, it turns out that it's surprisingly easy to focus the eyes on different depths, and I'm sure that that effect will be exploited better as more VR applications are developed. Another thing to note is that the clarity of the display is somewhat higher than shows up in the recording. The recording is, despite my efforts, still significantly degraded compared to what I'm actually seeing. This is razor sharp. I'm not seeing any screen door effect. I'm not seeing any red, green, or blue sub-pixels. I am seeing just a little bit of blur in the overlay, but not in the application. But that's a software problem that I'm sure will be fixed in time. That's due to Steam VR blurring things just a little bit and I haven't been able to fix that problem for the overlays yet. Pilots are reminded to land only on their designated landing pad. Unauthorized landing in other areas within the perimeter of the port is not allowed. Recorder, stop. <laughs> 